Lindsay. And I'm Sarah. And together, we're the co-founders of Whale Tales, a living library of cetacean stories. Today, we are going to talk about what on earth is Whale Tales. <laughs> um, and so for all of you people listening, you will get a crash course in who we are and what our organization is and why we created this crazy thing called Whale Tales. Plus, fun facts. Plus, plus... Uh, we, of course, will be telling some stories, um, and since this is our first episode, we're going to be telling a couple of stories that, uh, of special encounters that have happened when we were, all three of us were together. Aww. Aww. So grab a blanket and a drink and get comfy, because we're going to dive right in. To lead us off, we thought we'd talk about what exactly is Whale Tales, and where did it come from? Why did we start it, and what do we all do? Nicole, do you want to start us off with where the idea came from? Because it was your idea. Sure. So, uh, I went to an international interpreters conference in Sweden in 2013, and while I was there, I went to a panel about the importance of interpreters and naturalists and environmental educators talking to each other across continents because of the migration patterns of birds, and how it's completely ridiculous to try and interpret just one part of a bird's life or their year or their cycle or whatever it is uh, without including the rest of that migration and the rest of their lives and because you may be talking about birds in England but those birds spend part of their year in South America wouldn't it be great if you knew what those birds were doing in South America and wouldn't it be even greater if you actually could say hey I talked to Juan and he said that the birds were doing this two months ago and they're on their way back. Anyway, the point was <laughs> that people who are educating about a species that crosses countries or continents or any kind of geographical boundary should know what the animal is doing in the other parts of their migration and should be talking to each other to be able to tell a more complete story. Anyway, so fast forward to the fact that the three of us have all at some point loved whales and loved talking about whales, uh, and they don't spend their whole year here in British Columbia. So I thought this was a really great idea. I really appreciated the panel. And all of a sudden, I started thinking specifically about humpback whales and the fact that not only do they spend parts of the year in Hawaii and parts of the year in the mainland United States and parts of the year in BC and then up to Alaska and even into Mexico and all kinds of crazy things. But the, the same humpback whale could have three, sometimes even four different research numbers because of the fact that they're traveling through so many different countries. <laughs> so it's impossible for researchers even to really understand what is happening with that whale um so i was thinking about the fact that it's just really really hard for researchers even to keep track of what's going on with humpback whales because they aren't tracked in one kind of universally accessible database and that that's a problem and it should be fixed and of course that was what i intended whale tales to do and then it blossomed into something very different but even more awesome <laughs> So then I talked to you guys, and I was like, hey, I have this idea. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, and I think we all started getting excited because we all enjoyed spending time together, all three of us, and it was exciting to have the thought of working on a cool project together that might lead to fun new opportunities for us to do even more stuff together. Yeah. So I guess on that, um, yeah, so we started working on the idea and started talking to um, our other friends who work uh, in and around where wild whales are seen. Um, we had some connections with researchers, whale watching naturalists, all that kind of stuff. So we um, started reaching out to them about um, would they be willing to tell us their stories and put them on the internet yeah so that was exciting because we had a lot of great feedback from um other naturalists and people who were um also excited about the idea of having a shared library so um, and i think i'm trying to remember because my brain is not as good as Lindsay's at remembering things <laughs> but i feel like it was when 
was it when we started talking, the three of us, or when we started talking to our naturalist friends, that it kind of morphed from being, like, a place to try and keep track of the same animal here, there, and everywhere and for researchers into, no, this should actually be for just everybody and it should be story-based and it should be anybody's stories because everybody has the opportunity to see something awesome. You don't have to have a degree just to have an amazing encounter. I think that was before we started talking to other people. I think that yeah, was like I think that was mostly you from what I remember, just sort of riffing <laughs> on your original idea of like, Let's figure out where whales go. Well, but like people are researching that and we don't always have the best um, connections with them because they have to wait for publication deadlines and all that kind of stuff before they can like broadcast all of their information. So I think we started thinking about things that we could do, even if we couldn't get the kinds of information that ideally we thought at that point we wanted or we ah. need to do that original plan, I think. I was so smart. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, probably when talking to, uh, like, talking to us and Sarah came up with the, or had the knowledge that we could tag not just uh, species, but individuals uh, on our posts. So yeah. that, and then that kind of morphed into the, like, it doesn't have to be, like, live. It doesn't have to be only this year. It can be whatever time line um but so if you have the individual you could just look up stories any stories that we have regardless of the year so that also kind of like because like that's what we can do with our website as opposed to trying to track their migration route in 2018 or whatever yeah yeah i think that seemed more attainable like oh we can just use um any other web development nerds out there uh, we can just use whale uh put whale tails on a WordPress site, use the built-in categories and tags to tag different animals on our website. And then people can just go be like, oh, I saw this whale. I wonder where else other people have seen that whale. And mm -hmm. it can bring up stories from like last week, last year, decades ago, depending on the animal. And it could be stories here in, uh, we're in British Columbia, but it could be anywhere all over the world. Um, and it's kind of cool that that actually happens now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously, in addition to just having a website, we needed to make a name for ourselves and get our information out there. And uh, social media, especially this was 2014, social media was like a big deal, but wasn't as like, I don't think as obvious a choice as it would be now. Like now, of course, you're going to start a Twitter and a Facebook and an Instagram, but I think you know, it was like, yeah, we should do that. We can do that. We Which is crazy people. that that in yeah. just five years has changed that much. But absolutely. Yeah. It was like, do you think we need an Instagram account? Oh, wait, no, actually, that's like one of our most important platforms now. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. and I think, I think we always would have started that, but it, it morphed from being just having social media to promote our website to being that our social media presence is like a main part of how we engage with our audience. Um, yeah. And mostly yeah. that's thanks to Lindsay because yeah. we all started by having like a monthly or weekly schedule of rotating through. It was who monthly. Would, who would look after the social media accounts. We called it czaring because we thought that sounded fancy. So like we would be <laughs> the social media czar. <laughs> and um, pretty quickly realized that Lindsay was really good at it. I think hopefully Lindsay really liked it. And <laughs> hmm, I wonder. <laughs> and um, I made myself pretty busy with the website stuff at that point. And then, yeah, and then Nicole's life was kind of crazy. And it just, it sort of morphed into how we've now split up our different roles. So I look after the website, Lindsay looks after the social media, and Nicole looks after all of our um like actual content you know she wrote the outline for this podcast yeah that's that's what we do yeah. so um lizzie do you want to talk about sort of how we went from just like having a website and some social media and some random friends and then how we grew into what we are now yeah it definitely was like a cyclical chicken egg <laughs> scenario because we had before we started we had some like beta storytellers too because we have a forum on our website just yeah. hit share. Um, whale-tails.org. You'll hear it more times. Yeah. 
Um, so we had a form and we, like, we went through and thought about the things that we wanted to look for because, you know, specific things like lat long, we don't care about that. We're not going to be publishing this in a scientific journal. We're just looking for a generic location, um, so that people can search by that location. So if you wanted to search by Salish Sea or Vancouver Island or Maui or something, then you could see all those whales. Um... So, yeah, so we had some beta testers, and those people, we got uh, probably, like, I don't know, 10 stories to start off with then, and um, then we launched on November 22nd, 2014, which was the Marine Mammal Symposium that year, so we announced there, uh, and we, Nicole, because she's our press secretary. (laughs) um, (laughs) My favorite title of all of my titles. (laughs) Yeah. Um, reached out to talk to a bunch of people that she knew, Whale Watch naturalists and stuff, about um, sharing their stories. And, you know, like it was off-season, so that was a great time to get people to start. But getting people to write out their stories and submit photos and stuff, especially Whale Watch naturalists who see whales every day or even twice a day, all season long, can that that's really hard to get all of their stories. So what we ended up doing... Uh, was we got these regular storytellers who were already posting their stories on their social media accounts um, and we followed them and we got their permission to take their stories from their social media accounts and transfer it over to our website which is how we really started to gain a baseline um, Which and that's also how we started to then realize that we can use social media to get stories instead of just telling people on social media to submit their stories so we, I started reaching out to other people. I started telling people that they could tag us in their posts, and then we could uh, then we would reach out to them, and we can we would take their stories from there, which is how we got a bunch more of our storytellers. We now have ten regular storytellers that we get their stories from every time they go out, and then they post about it, um, which is great. We've got a bunch from here. We've got um, the one from up the island, or two from up the island. We've got one in Boston, and we have one in Perth, Australia. Um, we've also had some different in-person events over the years. Um, we've had a few small, intimate gatherings of our local storyteller friends that we've gotten to know mm-hmm. or already knew before Whale Tales. Um, we like to call it wine and cheese and whales because it sounds classy <laughs> and fun. And it's basically... <laughs> Plus, what <laughs> better way on... to spend an evening than drinking wine, eating cheese, basically. and telling stories about whales? Yeah, it's like pretty much exactly what we're here for. So yeah, we just turn on our recording uh, devices or take notes and uh, yeah, just see mm-hmm. what stories they have to share. It always gets out interesting tidbits of crazy adventures, which is fun. Yeah, we've had a couple of other events on Saturna Island, which we're going to talk more about later, mm-hmm. um, where we had some guests with, um, who were pretty great guests, including Dr. Andrew Trites, um, who would tell their stories about whales or they would speak about a certain subject and then tell their stories. And then we were able to open it up because it's July or August in Vancouver, in BC, we called it campfire stories without the campfire. Um, (laughs) and we got some incredible stories from those people. I just have these, um, memories of scribbling in my, um, notebook using my phone as a flashlight because it was very very dark yeah like nine and o'clock in writing. august <laughs> nine o'clock in august yeah but everybody um, stayed because the stories were yeah, so good everybody cause... stayed because and it was so great and everybody yeah. really loved it and that's just that's also just a great way to get the word out for people to visit our website and yeah. our social media and also to submit their stories later um and we've had some other super random things in fact literally three days ago <laughs> we were on a panel um, at a, the Environmental Film Festival, the Elements Film Festival, where Nicole, because she's our press secretary, <laughs> was on a panel about the future of the Southern Resin Killer Whales. Yeah. So, yeah. It's pretty it's cool. A, mm-hmm. And that was really crazy. It's crazy to think about the fact that this started as a idea from a conference that I had that then I was like, I would really love to work on this with my two best friends to ah this is kind of just a fun little side thing that we can do because we all like whales to now we have over twenty five thousand followers on our various social media platforms actually probably closer to like over thirty thousand followers on all three twitter instagram and facebook and 
we were asked to be on a panel with representatives from OceanWise. The the representative was Dr. Lance Bright Leonard, who we also have some stories from, and he's like one of the top killer whale researchers. And us, and also someone from Raincoast Conservation Society, but like that was a huge recognition for how far we've come from just chatting in our apartment to be like, this is something we should do, right? (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Nick, do you want to share a little bit about on that subject, where we are now, sort of what we've got and what our plans are for the near future? Yeah, absolutely. So we have, as of this weekend, because Lindsay was putting stories up on the website this weekend, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, 543 stories featuring yes that is correct excellent and they feature over 30 different species of cetacean so i think that's the part that i get really excited about because i'm very familiar with Me too. harbor porpoises and killer whales and humpback whales and a little bit of the pacific white-sided dolphins because we see those animals in our own backyard here and gray whales but the fact that people have submitted stories from all over the world like all over and the there are 30 different species represented in our library. That's crazy to me. Uh, we talked a little mm-hmm. bit about how many followers we have. Instagram is definitely our our biggest platform, which makes sense when you think about what Instagram is for from a storytelling perspective. Um, we have over 20,000 followers on Instagram. And now we've decided to grow even more by starting this podcast which is super awesome because all three of us love podcasts and we've got a patreon started uh and we're just we're doing it guys (laughs) yeah um Lindsay, what are you most excited about with having a podcast Oh, I don't know. I think I'm probably hopefully getting some really cool guests because it's, I, I know because I'm the one who talks to them mainly uh, online is that a lot of our friends that we know who see amazing things don't have time because they're out there seeing amazing things every day. And so sitting down with them for maybe like, I don't even know, like even like three hours and splitting them up into different episodes is probably one of the best ways to get stories. And I am all about getting stories. I get so excited when people send us stuff. Um, With the species count, we just got a new killer whale ecotype. We got the uh, Caribbean killer whales. We got our first story for that, uh, which was super exciting. And I just, I love that. And I love to hear stories about our regulars. Like we have some great stories about a lot of the different transient or bigs killer whales that are around um, in the Salish Sea, all spring summer and fall and they're coming back right now so we're getting some great stories about some old favorites and just i love to get stories because it makes me really happy um not just because i like stories but it also gives me content to put on our social media accounts which makes my life easier sarah what are you excited for um i think i'm most excited about reaching a different audience like i think podcasts that's really where they excel is reaching right literally into people's ears and telling them stories. And I think podcasts are perfect for storytelling. Uh, Nature and whales is really perfect for storytelling. So I think it's just like a great evolution. Um, And also I love podcasts. Like I'm a huge fan of podcasts. And then um, through liking certain podcasts, like became a fan of like how the back end of podcasts work and like the, not the business side, but like the, the technology and the, like how it actually all comes together. So I'm excited about that. Um, Nick, what are you most excited about? You totally took mine, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. I think, I think it's, it's slightly different though, because what I'm most excited about is, it's going to sound really cheesy, but it's always what I come back to because what I'm most excited about with the podcast format is being able to reach not just more people and different people, but people specifically who don't see these animals all the time and who may happen across our website, but you know, sometimes you don't necessarily have time to read a website when everything else is going on in your life. And so you may miss some stories, but podcasts are easier to do sort of when you're on your way to work or when you're studying for an exam and the people who live in 
the middle of or just in landlocked countries or the middle of countries that are bordered by water but these people who don't have the opportunity to see these animals all the time but who are super interested in them and really passionate about them for those people to feel like they have a community and you guys have heard this all the time Lizzie and Sarah but like I grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I loved whales from when I was four years old. And nobody else got it <laughs> when I was growing up. I was the dolphin girl, but everyone kind of just laughed at me about it. And when I would tell people, when they would ask, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I'd be like, I'm going to be a marine biologist. And they're like, yeah, sure, cool. Or you're going to work on a farm. <laughs> and I would have loved this. I would have loved for something like this to exist when I was little. And so that's what I get most excited about. And I hope that someone out there listening is a young person who just loves whales and feels at home now. Aww. Yeah. So nice. All right. So um, I guess we'll move on now to our uh, non-whale tales, but just whale specific um nick we've got some fun facts fun flipper fact time it's fun flipper facts yeah that's my song (laughs) i made it up right now (laughs) um (laughs) i love fun facts and specifically i really enjoy fun nerdy facts about whales so hence when we were talking about starting a podcast i was like there has to be a segment about fun facts and fun flipper facts was born out of that so since this is our first episode we're going to start with some basics some basic facts that you need to know about cetaceans uh starting with how many are there and you would think this would be a really easy question to answer but it's not (laughs) because scientists can be counted on for one thing and that is to not agree on stuff (laughs) So depending on which scientist you ask, there are between 89-ish and 94-ish species of cetacean. You can break that down to people tend to agree for the most part on how many baleen whales there are. There's usually, when you look that up, there's usually, there are 15. Great. Cool. Okay. Um, it gets a lot more complicated when you start looking into the other branch of the cetacean group, which we'll talk about later, uh, the toothed whales. But the best guess, best average, I suppose, not really a guess, it's just disagreement. <laughs> the best number is usually people would say there's 79 toothed whales. And that breaks down even further to there are 27 toothed whales. These are the narwhal, beluga, the various different species of sperm whale, and all of the beaked whales, of which there are many. And then there are approximately 45 species of dolphin, and the one that everybody does agree on. This is the one that everybody is okay with. There are seven species of porpoise. Uh, now, of course, wouldn't be an intro to all the facts you need to know about stations without looking at what's the biggest, what's the smallest, la la la. So, Lindsay, what's the biggest cetacean? Tell us about it. Well, I think probably a large majority of people already know this as opposed to what the smallest cetacean is. Um, because it's the biggest animal on Earth currently, and probably most people agree, biggest animal on Earth ever, I mean, all the times. Um, and it is the blue whale. Ah. Um, so blue whales are average about 30 meters or 98 feet in length. Um, and their heart is larger than a Volkswagen Beetle, which is everybody's favorite fact. Not my favorite fact about blue whales, actually. Well, <laughs> can I tell you my favorite fact about blue whales? Of course you can. You can stand a hundred fully grown people on their tongue. <laughs> yep. Well, that was my other big thing, oh. is their tongue weighs 2.7 tons, <laughs> or fi- um, 5,400 pounds, which yeah. is larger. Weird. And that's one of lots of other yeah. whales. <laughs> exactly. They don't have a weight of a blue whale, because how would you measure that? Yeah. But they do have the weights of tongues because whales wash up. Um, so then also the craziest thing is, well, one of my craziest fun facts is that they, at times when they need to, they could reach up to 50 kilometers an hour, which I guess it's really easy to swim 50 kilometers an hour when you're 30 meters long. 
But can you imagine seeing that? Like, that's been super intense. Uh, and blue whales feed exclusively on krill. They are baleen whales. Um, so they can eat up to 40 million krill or almost 8,000 8, pounds a day. Um, yep. They were decimated by whaling, which is lame. Um, and there's, they're currently estimated to be at about 7% of their pre-whaling population. About 15,000 animals worldwide. It's definitely better than it was, which is yeah. how all whaling populations are, <laughs> mostly. Um, or all, sorry, all whales who were hunted. Mm -hmm. um, so they're coming back slowly. The bigger the animal it is, usually the harder it is to come, the slower things are to come back, especially because their reproductive rates are so slow. Um, cool things that I like about blue whales. There's a life-size model in the Natural History Museum in New York that we visit every time we're there. And we always start a trend <laughs> because we lie underneath it on the floor. And then everybody else does as well. The other spot that we're very familiar with with a full-size full -size blue whale is the Beatty Biodiversity Museum at UBC. It has a um, full skeleton that has been... The, from a whale that washed up on in PEI um, in a year that I did once remember, but it's gone now. Long time ago. Yeah. Um, which they then buried and all the stuff came off. And you can look it up. There's lots and lots of stories about it. Um, but that's been a big part of our lives mm -hmm. um, for the last five years. And then the other one that was a more recent fact is just over a few weeks ago, there was two reports of Australian killer whales killing... Um, not calves, but no, not full size, but juvenile blue whales. Uh, so just a reminder that killer whales are intense mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, and will kill basically anything if they were feeling like it. So I've got some fun flicker facts about our smallest species of cetacean. And that is the smallest species of porpoise known as the vaquita. Uh, vaquita is the Spanish word for little cow. And they're one of the only species of porpoise to live in warm water. They're found exclusively in the Gulf of California, so like the body of water between Baja California and Mexico. And they hunt for small fish and squid in shallow lagoons. Um, they are solitary, like most other species of porpoises. They're generally only found uh, with a mother and a calf. Um, otherwise, they're found by themselves. And they're quite uh, shy um, but because of their small size, probably. Um, vaquita weigh about 43 kilograms, so that's an adult, and get up to about max one and a half meters in length, but I think they're generally um, a bit smaller than that. They are one of the most endangered, uh, they are the most endangered marine mammal in the world. It's unknown exactly how many are left. There could be um, probably between 10 and 30 at the absolute most. Um, the vaquita population has been in really sharp decline for decades, and it recently was accelerated because of an increase in illegal fishing with gillnet for the endangered totoba, a large fish that's sought after for its swim bladder. So this fish is already endangered, which I think has driven up the price. And then there's more illegal fishing for this fish, and then um, the uh, vaquita, which are about the same size as the fish, get caught in the nets. So... Um, yeah, the vaquita story is pretty sad, but um, I think there's a lot of people working really hard to uh, figure out what we can do to help improve their situation. Um, our friends at the Porpoise Conservation Society have a great website. If you go to porpoise.org slash save the vaquita, we'll put a link in the show notes, and there's lots of information there about what you can do. But a few key things are to um, use... Uh, sustainable seafood, if you are a person that eats seafood, um, looking into sustainable seafood choices, uh, and also talking to your elected officials, um, because I think having pressure on, it's the Mexican government that is there, and obviously these fisheries are illegal, but any support that we can have for the local people, like, they're just trying to feed their families and, um, you know, like anybody, you know, get have jobs and um, ha make a living in the place that they want to live so it's hard, really hard for them when um, you know to make a sustainable choice that's not sustainable for their life so I think any any um, political pressure that we can do for the Mexican government to help them live where they want to live um, 
but not have to participate in illegal fisheries um, is great. So yeah, if you check out the porpoise.org site, they have lots more information and details about how you can help Fakita. And just to finish off our fun flipper facts section with a little uh, Latin lesson for those of you who are oh, no. super nerdy. <laughs> well, it'll spice it up after the slider downer of our last Yeah, it's true. Fun Let's facts. speak some Latin. Uh, dead languages are the best. <laughs> Um, I actually do love Latin and specifically when you're talking about species names, Nerd. I know. <laughs> I get really, really into why species were named what they were. It's actually very hard to find that information sometimes. Um, yeah. so I have prepared for you two and for all of our listeners, a little lesson into the origin of cetacean. And also the two different branches of the cetacean group, the mystices and the odontices. Are you ready? So ready. Yes. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the fact that cetaceans are sometimes considered an order of animal. And now also because classification is way more complicated than when I was in school, they are also considered an infra order. Mm. Ugh. Linnaeus is rolling over in his grave. <laughs> but basically, cetaceans are all whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And the word cetacean comes from both the Latin for cetus, uh, or sorry, the Latin word cetus, which means or meant large sea creature. Makes sense for some of the bigger cetaceans. <laughs> Uh, but it also comes from the ancient Greek, not to be confused with current Greek language, uh, word katos, which meant at various times either sea monster, huge fish, or eventually whale. So both cetus and katos are where we get the first part of cetacean. And then the suffix of the word asia coming into cetacean just means from Latin of the nature of. So technically speaking, cetacean means of the nature of a large sea monster slash huge fish slash whale. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sounds about right. Then there are the two suborders, or to use the new classification standards, parv orders. <laughs> All of you who are currently taking biology in university, I am sorry for you. Um, but there are two different branches, regardless of whether they're parv orders or suborders, two different branches of cetaceans, the mystices, which are the baleen whales, and the odontoses, which are the toothed whales. So mystice, I like this one the most. Um, that word comes from the Greek mystax, which means mustache. <laughs> because for most baleen whales, if they open their mouths just a little bit, you can see all of the baleen and apparently ancient Greeks thought that they had mustaches on these giant sea monsters. <laughs> Oh, so cute. So that's where the first part comes from. And then the second part of the word mystice is also going back to that Greek katos and Latin cetus. Um, so it's kind of like a whale with a mustache. Those are your baleen whales, your mystices. Then anyone who's ever had braces, you probably know where odontices comes from. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> odontices <laughs> comes from the Greek odont, which means tooth. So you got your baleen whales. They're the mustache whales. And you got your toothed whales. They are just toothed whales. Yeah. Whales with teeth. Yay. Beautiful. That's your Latin for today. Hooray. Fun flipper facts. Yeah, fun flipper facts. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my. See, this <laughs> is why. my favorite part of the podcast. You should support us on Patreon so we can find um, real musicians to write <laughs> us some songs. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Or just, they don't need to write them. Nicole can write them. Nicole yeah. Record them better. Just perform them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. oh my goodness. Okay. It's story time. The main event. Oh, the main event. Yay. Oh. So, here we are. Children, story time. Everybody gather round. Um, as we, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to talk about a couple of stories that we, um, that happened to all three of us, um, in the past couple of years. So in our past, in our storied youth, um, <laughs> we spent a lot of time on Saturna Island on the, in the Gulf Islands, which is in, um, which is off the coast of British Columbia in the Salish Sea. Um, and we spent a lot of summers going over probably on the same weekend every year uh in the middle of july 
Mm-hmm. And we had some kind of, because we went over there at the same time, we kind of had some very clockwork encounters with uh, some familiar fins. Oh, <laughs> we like <Ooh>. that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Alliteration is your friend. <laughs> uh, well, I know it's your friend. Uh, <laughs> So, I don't remember which one of you is going first, but one of you go. Me! All right. Okay. Tell us your tale. Well, it starts like this. It was a beautiful, sunny July, BC day. The best kind of day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were on the beach. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at that amazingly charismatic, awesome animal known as... The sea cucumber. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as well as a number of other invertebrates. Because we were on the beach and helping volunteer for an event called the Intertidal Safari. Where people who are properly trained can bring up invertebrate animals from the surf area. And below there's actually some divers who go down and collect these animals and bring them up to the beach for a little bit making sure that they're properly cared for, not being too stressed out and getting the right water, all of the things, um, so that people on the beach have the opportunity to see these animals that they maybe didn't even know were under the water. It's a very cool event. Mm-hmm. All three of us also really like invertebrates, yes. but they yes. are maybe not the best characters in stories. <laughs> we'll no. just, that's why we didn't yeah. start an invertebrate tales. Much to my, <laughs> much to my sadness. I was just going to say, Sarah's <laughs> sad about that. <laughs> it's true. But they're awesome. Um, and so we were helping to teach people about... I remember sea cucumbers specifically because I had a huge California sea cucumber in the little bin that I was kind of manning. And I was mid-talk about this sea cucumber's amazing ability to vomit out its own organs, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that the people I was talking to weren't paying any attention. And I was like... Dude, (laughs) first of all, I know that I'm a really good public speaker. (laughs) And second of all, this is really cool. This animal can literally, literally spit out its own organs. So I followed their eyes and was like, oh, I understand why you're not paying any attention to my sea cucumber and my story. Because there's killer whales about 100 meters away. So this beach that we that we were on um, is on Saturna Island, as Lindsay said, and specifically it's just at the east point of the island called East Point. Ooh, <laughs> um, and it's got a channel between Saturna Island and Tumbo Island, which is like I don't know, a, I have no idea how many meters away Tumbo Island is, but you could throw a rock over there. <laughs> Some people could throw a rock over there. <laughs> Um, and the channel between these challenges is actually very, very deep. And we noticed that sort of popcorn style as, or the wave as you were at a hockey game, people were noticing on the beach that there was a huge group of killer whales coming through the channel. Um, and they were moving really fast, really, really fast. Because, uh, when I first noticed that my sort of sea cucumber audience was looking out into the ocean uh and I turned around I saw fins way off in the distance and then by the time everybody on the beach kind of heard about it, they were right there yeah in front of us uh and they were moving so quickly that even though I'm actually very familiar with the southern residents which I was pretty sure they were just based on the size of the group I didn't have time to get a good look at any fin except one um, but thankfully, I saw a pretty distinct male fin uh, that's cappuccino, one of the K's in the southern resident population. And I was pretty pumped because the K's are less frequently seen in BC than the J's are, at least they were at the time. Still are. So it was really, really exciting and uh, a little bit of a break in the invertebrate awesome day. And then, unfortunately for us and our invertebrates, <laughs> Everybody decided to follow the whales who kept moving around the east point of the island and they left us behind on the beach with our invertebrates. So that was sad for us, but awesome for those people who did follow the whales because uh, as we heard later from some of our friends who did go that way and kind of see where the whales were going, um, they rounded the point of the island and then just had a huge breaching 
party where a couple of the males in the group all started leaping out of the water. So cool for the people who saw that. Uh, a couple of years later, we were back on Saturna for the same event. And we were all, again, hanging out on the on the beach with our bins of invertebrates and um, having a blast. It was a beautiful day. And we started seeing a bunch of whale watching boats just off the point. Um, they were kind of sitting there and like it was pretty clear that they were whale watching boats cause partly because it was like the middle of the day and they probably weren't fishing because um, it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. And so we, you know, headed out down on the rocks, out, out, out on the tide. It was a super low tide day trying to see maybe we thought there was like a humpback out there that was diving and then somebody spotted like way in the distance, that super distinctive black tip of a killer whale. So um, then the boat started to take notice and that fin, there was uh, clear that there was a couple more and the whales started coming towards that same Tumbo Island and we were getting so excited because from two years earlier, they'd come on the inside of Tumbo and it was amazing. It was so cool to see them that close. And we started seeing all the little harbor seals like sort of popping their heads up. They were like popping their head down, looking around, trying to figure out what was going on. <laughs> so that behavior mostly, plus also the um, s- the size of the dorsal fins made us think that they were the bigs or transient killer whales, which are the mammal-eating uh, killer whales that we have around here. Because um, when there's uh, resident killer whales, the seals don't even pay any attention. Like, they're amazing at telling the difference. <laughs> yeah, so it looked like the whales were coming our way, and then they went on the outside of Tumbo, and we were all very sad. Yeah. <laughs> Foiled again. It wasn't our last visit with um friends on Saturn Island. No, it wasn't. Those ones didn't ever get close enough, but because of the size of the group, we were pretty sure it was the T-123s. Um, we have no confirmation on that, but they are very uh, often in that area. They like to come all the way in here. They're often the ones that are seen around um, Lionsgate Bridge and English Bay. If anybody is in Vancouver and knows that, they're they were three, T-123, T-123, A, and C, and now they have a little fourth. Yeah, they like it around here, and uh, we like them. They've got uh, T-123, A, Stanley has got a giant triangular dorsal fin, just like the cliche dorsal fin, so it's very very easy to uh, identify from far away. Um, but yeah, as you said, um, it was not our last encounter, Saturna. Um, area. So another year we were actually on the ferry um, to Saturna, which was the most ridiculous day of our lives. Um, We didn't, we missed our reservation or I don't even remember why we ended up being late. So I mean, taking the ferry to Saturna is never fun from Vancouver, but this was just over the top. (laughs) <laughs> what ended up happening, what I cannot remember the real reasons why, is we took the ferry from Vancouver to Victoria early in the morning, and then just was in were in Victoria. We pulled into Victoria as the ferry to turn was pulling out, which mm-hmm. is very annoying as just from a like scheduling. I, like it's, it's not like we were the only people on that ferry who needed to get on that other ferry, but so then we were just like in the Victoria ferry terminal for like five hours. So then we got on the Gulf Island ferry, which takes a long time, regardless of whether you're leaving from Vancouver or Victoria. And we went to all the islands and went to all the islands. And then we went to the last one, Maine Island. We were pretty excited because we were almost there. Uh, It wasn't Maine, sorry, Pender. And it was like 10 hours after we'd started our journey. (laughs) And we were almost there, and we were pretty excited, and like, and that's when it get like, the sun was setting, which is really depressing, because that is July, so you, it's a long day. Um, so we leave Pender, we're like, okay, cool, cool, let's go, we're gonna get there. And then there's an announcement that they forgot a car, or <laughs> somebody forgot to drive off, or something, like, utterly ridiculous. We had to go back to the ferry terminal. Uh, which was upsetting. But then, on our way back, or on our way back out, I cannot remember, like, basically the fourth time we were in the channel to (laughs) the 
from to or from the Par- Pender Island ferry terminal. There was much commotion and everybody shouting and a ton of Southern residents showed up. Um, the best part about this was that we had three of our friends with us. One from Canada who's been away for a long time, one from Sweden and one from Germany. And we had told them be- that we'd had these encounters with whales on this weekend mm-hmm. um, a couple of times. And so that we're, we're jokingly guaranteeing them um, <laughs> a sightings of killer whales. And there we were. We hadn't gotten there yet. We put them through this insane ordeal. They were super jet <laughs> And we're like, here, don't you want to ride a boat for 10 hours? Um, but there at the end, we had southern residents oh. spy hopping in the sunset uh, with the Gulf Islands. So that was pretty, pretty great. And then we went to the island. We did not yep. see whales on Intertidal Safari Day that day, but we did get ice cream. So, you know. <laughs> The one thing about Intertidal Safari, sometimes there are whales, always there is ice cream. Well, that's bringing us towards the end of our first Whale Tales podcast episode. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with each episode was obviously tell a story or a few, share some fun flipper facts, have some kind of discussion, but also leave you, our listeners, uh, with some kind of action that you can take to help cetaceans since you're listening to this podcast we are guessing you probably like cetaceans and would like them to stick around for a while so sometimes we'll talk about some big actions that you can take to try and help these animals and their ocean environments out Uh, but today we're going to start small with just what did you guys do today in your lives because we all lead very different types of lives these days um one work from home i'm staying home with my nine month old son and one goes to an office job uh so we have three very different lifestyles at the moment and uh what did you guys do today that was environmentally conscious of yourselves that hopefully our listeners can take and apply to their own lives um so i am the one who works from an office and um I mean, I guess it's technically environmentally friendly, but I walk to and from work, but that's just because I'm lucky enough to live close to where I work and uh, walking's better than the bus options that I have. So it's a nice walk. Um, But the thing that I did today that was different um, was I actually didn't bring my wallet to work. I packed my lunch. I packed a snack. There's coffee at work. I don't ever need to buy anything. I grabbed my ID and just popped it in my bag. Because I always know, like, when you're coming home from work, and especially for me when I'm walking, like, I walk by a different shops, uh, I walk by the grocery store, I'm like, oh, maybe I should just go in and pick up, blah, blah, blah. And, like, I didn't have my reusable bags with me. Like, I had my backpack, but I didn't have all my reusable bags. Um, and also, I'm just trying to buy less stuff. So just trying to not sort of incidentally go shopping, but try to be more thoughtful about when I'm buying not just groceries, but you know, treats and snacks and clothes and everything. So yeah, by not having my wallet with me, um, I didn't pick up like the one thing that I was like, oh, I kind of think I need blah, blah, blah from the grocery store. I made a note in my phone and I will pick it up when I'm intentionally at the grocery store. Nice. That was me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mine was also groceries related, although to be perfectly honest, it happened yesterday instead of today because I ended up um, babysitting for uh, seven hours, which is... <laughs> environmentally responsible uh most of the time but also exhausting um Mm -hmm. (laughs) so one of the big things one of the big things that is happening in bc right now if you're not uh, aware and if you live in bc is that soft plastic is now recyclable which is huge it's a huge part of at least my garbage so that means chip bags freezer bags um Ziploc bags, you know, produce like like, meshy bags. Yeah, meshy bags that avocados and tomatoes come in. Um, Just Ziploc bags in general. The bags that grapes come in. Like those kinds of things. Um, All of those also um, like Halloween candy wrappers. Like that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. It's all recyclable through drop-off at London Drugs. So at least the London Drugs that we go to just have it kind of at the front. The soft plastic and then some other ones... Some of them have lots of different other options, like electronics. Some of them have, like, light bulb recycling. Yeah. So there's lots of different stuff, and this is all set up through Recycle BC. You can also drop it off at Recycle BC depots. If you want to know more about that, you can check out the Recycle BC website. We have that linked on our What You Can Do page, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so that's a big thing that's 
been a big change in a lot of our lives recently, just noticing Mm -hmm. how less often I take the garbage out now. But the thing that I've been doing for a while, um, and including yesterday, is either bringing reusable produce bags or not putting my produce in a bag at all, just leaving it loose. So some people might find that weird or gross, but a lot of produce, well, most produce, you should be washing anyway when you were at home. mm -hmm. So, and a lot of that stuff, you're not even going to consume the skin, like lemons or oranges or potatoes, carrots, bananas. I see people putting bananas in plastic bags and I just, I, Uh. yeah. Um, (laughs) So there's a lot of different reusable produce bags out there where there's a link again on our what you can do page. Um, I really like mine. They're great for when you buy loose berries, when it's farmer's market time, or just you have a a fruit stand or something that has loose berries so like strawberries or raspberries or something that come in a punnet that are loose you can just uh, plop them in there other than that if you're concerned they don't weigh a lot more than a normal plastic bag so if you're concerned about the weight issue (laughs) with your like eight apples it's not going to be that hard uh it's not going to be that much of a difference um and even yesterday i forgot them but i wanted to buy celery so i just bet bought a big thing of loose celery and just plopped it in my basket and on the conveyor belt and in my reusable bag and I will wash it when I eat it because I was already going to do that and so I didn't use a bag. Even when I though I use my bla- bags for garbage instead of buying plastic bags for garbage but that still is one less mm. bag. So uh, mine's also grocery related oh. actually. Um, so I have a nine month, well, almost nine month old son who's basically a two year old <laughs> and eats like a, like a ten year old boy. Um, so we do a lot of grocery shopping in my house, and I don't have time to go to the store and go into the store. So uh, basically, since my son was born, I've been doing the pickup where you can go to the grocery store, order your groceries ahead of time, and they will bring them out to your car and it is a huge time saver in my like I can't stress how amazing that is in my life uh it's also you know I don't have to go through the hassle of getting my son out of the car and then into the stroller or into the something to get him into the cart it's just like no we go he stays in the car everything's awesome but the one thing that had been really bothering me about doing this was that there's no opportunity to use reusable bags in this case. And I'd always been really good about having my reusable bags with me when I went shopping, but now I was using a lot of plastic bags and I would feel really guilty about it every time that I would pick up the groceries. So I was trying to weigh my environmental guilt versus I'm a mother of a nine month old and that's a lot. (laughs) Um, And so I started chatting with, my Save on Foods grocer, who would always be the one to come and bring out my groceries to me. Uh, Hey, Emma. (laughs) Shout out to Emma at Save on. She's lovely. And I was talking to her last week when I was picking up the groceries and I was explaining this to her. I was like, hey, I feel really, really bad about all the plastic bags that I'm using when I come and pick up the groceries, but I just don't have the time to go into the store and do the shopping myself. But I also don't want to make your life as the person who's doing my grocery shopping for me harder by asking you to, I don't know, pick up reusable bags from every time, save them somewhere in the store. Like, what what can we do here? Um, And I came up with the idea, talking to Emma, uh, they have bins, like big green bins that they keep your groceries in in a fridge or a freezer, depending on what it is that you're picking up, until you get there. And usually the groceries are in those bins in bags already, but they don't have to be because those bins fit in the grocery carts. And so when they're going around and picking up your groceries for you, they only put them in bags because they think they're going to need to take them out and put them in your car. And I was like, okay, wait, if you do that, then when I come in my car, I can have a big Rubbermaid tote that's empty in the trunk of my car and we can just move the groceries from one bin to the other and use zero bags. Hooray. And so today, that's what we did. It was our first trial run. 
and Emma was there and she was ready and I'd made a note in my online order and she came out and there were zero additional plastic bags in my grocery order and it was amazing um and Emma said this is really awesome and I've had a couple of other people who come on the regular who've said that they miss using the reusable bag so I'm actually going to pass this on as an idea and see if those people want to try it so that made me feel really really good and then I got home and I did one other thing that was really exciting um because I actually feel like I became a less environmentally conscious person when I got pregnant um, even though it had always been something that was really important to me and now I was bringing a new life on earth and so I wanted to teach that new human being to be environmentally conscious I just got a lot more tired and it became a lot harder and so the other thing that I had been feeling really really guilty about environmentally since not even just giving birth but being pregnant in the first place was I had developed guys I'm ready to confess it I got really addicted to Perrier. No, no. Yeah. You so when I was fancy pregnant, snob. <laughs> I know. When I was pregnant, I couldn't drink alcohol, obviously, and that was a bummer. Um and I also couldn't drink Coca-Cola, which I would usually have if I can't drink alcohol. I couldn't really have anything fun. Being pregnant's great. <laughs> Um, and so really like the only kind of nice, exciting thing I could have as a treat, uh, was sparkling water and man, did I get obsessed with it, specifically the green apple Perrier. That continued after giving birth to my son because I'm breastfeeding mom. So being able to drink is possible, but not a lot and also you know having a lot of other stuff in my system not super great for my son so I have continued to consume a lot of sparkling water that comes in either glass or plastic bottles and I have felt bad about it all the time and so finally this weekend I decided enough of it and rather than cut my addiction because you know that's hard (laughs) I bought a soda stream Mm. Nice. And I set it up when I got home from the grocery store and my son went down for a nap today and I made my own green apple sparkling water and it was super fun and awesome and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really great and also fun because sparkling up your own water is super awesome. It's very satisfying. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was me today. So as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, the, we do have a what you can do link, which is a great list of things you can do. Just super small changes. Um, some that might seem small, but are actually really, really big. And some that are small that every time you do them can lead to something even bigger. Um, we've got lots of great suggestions on there. And we'll put the link in the show notes. And you can also find it by going to our website um, and clicking on the Tales of Saving Whales on the left-hand column. And it's the first thing you're going to see when you're in that section. So check that out for just tiny little things that you can do every day to help cetaceans and marine life and the earth in general. And while you're on our website, you can uh, find all the links to subscribe to our podcast, or you can just listen to our podcast directly on our website. As well on our podcast, you can check us out on Patreon. You can either go, there's a link on our website, or you can just go to patreon.com slash whaletales. And that's where all of our patrons get to sign up to help us Uh, bring this show to the world every month Um, by becoming a patron you get to help vote on what the next fun fact or story is going to be for our podcast and you'll get a fun shout out on social media and we're really excited to be expanding our awesome set of rewards for our uh, awesome patrons as that we grow that program so we hope you'll check that out what else is on the left hand of the set of the website nicole all of our social media platforms so you can find us on twitter and facebook and instagram and you can like the things that you see there you can talk to us and tell us what you'd like to see or hear on this podcast and you can also share your stories and if you would rather do that through the website itself that is probably the most important thing on the left hand side of our website the share your story button it's really 
not a big deal. It's not scary. You do not have to be an expert in these animals. If you have seen a whale, a dolphin, or a porpoise, and you really enjoyed that experience, we'd love to hear about it. And we'd love to add your story to our library. So please, please consider sharing your story. Our website can be found at whale dash tales.org that's tales like the stories not tales like the animals <laughs> t-a-l-e-s and i think that brings us to the end of our very first episode Yay! thank you very very much for listening thank you for supporting us uh even if you aren't able to support us on patreon if you do want to give us a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on uh, we would really appreciate that and we'd really appreciate your feedback because this is new for us and it's something we want to keep doing so please let us know what you thought and how we can do it better yeah we will be back on the last wednesday of may with some exciting more stories and facts and trivia and a theme that Nicole's really excited about because she's a nerd. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And we look forward to talking to you again. Thanks and have a whaley great day.